Are you ready to enter the deepest caverns and the darkest dungeons? To meet monsters from the greatest legends? Will you survive? <laughs> All right, that'll do. Let's do this. Hello there, I'm Simon. Welcome to my channel. Hear ye, hear ye. Hear the tale of the warrior's tree. Sorta. It's time for another tale from the dungeon. In the last episode, I told you about the first ever game of Dungeons and Dragons that I played. Now, I have since played a couple more games, and I do have some more tales that I can tell about that. I'm not going to. Because recently, something happened that's a little more significant. Recently, in the past month, I ran my first game as a DM. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. Now, I considered not telling this story, because I may at some point want to run a variation of it uh, with another group. And of course I can't do that if they've already seen this. But obviously I changed my mind. That's because uh, we played with the same exact group as we played last time. Uh, except uh, the person who DM'd last time wasn't DMing this time. Uh, she was a player and I wasn't. So my character wasn't there and there was a new character. Uh, and that allowed me to do some interesting things. That brought this story to a whole new level. And I kinda think that it will never be this good again. So I decided to just tell it. And I'll just have to come up with something new for the next group. So, let's roll for initiative. Because here we go. Yeah, I know. This isn't a real dice, it doesn't even have numbers, but just roll with it. For real though, I had them start by rolling for initiative. We find our adventurers in a cave. In front of them are seven armed skeletons. And behind that is the work in living space of a necromancer. That necromancer is standing there Casting his spells, animating the skeletons, which are attacking them. We have a human ranger called Artorius Dundragon, and a gnome druid called Ella. And a little further, we have a half-elf bard, and she is clearly not part of the same group. But they are there for the same reason. That reason is that the necromancer has something they are tasked to retrieve. They were hired by the queen of the lands, where they are, called Queen Regina, to retrieve a precious stone, a stone called the MacGuffin. And the necromancer has that stone. So they fight those skeletons and kind of sort of hit them to pieces. And then the bard yells at the necromancer I don't actually remember what she yelled. <laughs> but that took him out of his concentration and he tried to fire an Eldritch Blast, which didn't work. So uh, our adventurers quickly beat up all the skeletons and took the necromancer hostage. And they bound him. They put rope all around him so he couldn't move. <laughs> he couldn't do anything. And then they started talking um, to, well, to each other, because two of them knew each other, but the bard, they didn't know. So why was she here? What was she doing? And they also asked the necromancer, where is the MacGuffin? Uh, turns out that Artorius and Ella, they were sent together to retrieve the MacGuffin, but the bard, who's called Jay, she has a longer more complicated name, but I have no idea how to pronounce that, so I'm not going to. Uh, we call her Jay anyway. Jay was sent for the exact same reason, except she was sent separately. They also asked where the MacGuffin was, 
Well, the Necromancer didn't want to say, but uh, there was like an alcove with a sort of altar on in it. On that altar was a chest about, about this big, uh, very ornate. Yeah, they figured out pretty quickly that in that chest was probably the MacGuffin. So they talked a bit about what to do now. And they decided to just uh, take the MacGuffin to the Queen. All three of them together. And because they didn't really trust, uh, well, the Necromancer or the Queen, they decided to take the Necromancer too. So one of them took the MacGuffin uh, and Artorius took the Necromancer, put him over his shoulder and off they went. They left the cave uh, and turns out the entrance was in a forest. So they went through the forest onto uh, white fields of grass. Meadows? I think meadows is a word. Uh, and then they come at a river which is going pretty much the direction they're going, so they follow it. And then they come to a bridge. And they see that on that bridge is a huge dude and a smaller man, which they can't really see yet. So they come closer. And then they see that the big uh, fellow was actually a troll. And that troll is attacking the other man. Okay, I'm not sure what they did then. <laughs> Uh, but I think they just yelled at the troll and the troll then pushed the other man aside and came running at them. Roll for initiative. So yeah, they fought the troll. Troll almost took out Artorius, but in the end they beat the troll. Troll collapses. Then they went up to the other man who turns out is a vagabond. He travels all around, doesn't really have a home, doesn't really care for one. Turns out his name is Dan. And Dan knows a lovely little village called Wackerdam. And he invites them to come along. They follow Dan to the village and they go to a tavern. A tavern called The Drunken Pony. And they drink something, uh, they meet the bartender, the owner, uh, called Judith. Oh, they also asked Judith if she knew anything about the Necromancer, who's also still there, uh, or about the MacGuffin, which she didn't. Um, they did cast Detect Magic or Identify it and found out that it is in fact just a pretty rock. <laughs> and they also meet the mayor, who welcomes them to Wackerdam. Guess who also happens to be there? So they look over and at one of the tables they spot a halfling bard with fiery red hair. Oh yes, that is Homer Chowton, aka my own character from the first game. I got him in there. Um, so he comes up to them and of course he knows Artorius and Ella so they talk. So then evening comes, night comes, and they go to bed. The next morning they wake up and they go to have breakfast. And they do. But they are interrupted. They're interrupted by the mayor who comes in with his bodyguards and he's very distraught. He looks very scared. He goes to them and he says, oh my god I'm so happy you're still here. Please, we need your help. Please, please come. And he beckons them out of the tavern. And he brings them to the city square, village square. On the village square, there is a huge mass of people. So the mayor brings them to the center of that mass, where they find the bloody, torn apart remains of Homer Chowton. So obviously, they're shocked. So the mayor asked them to investigate. Find out what happened here. Find out who did it. Uh, and they start their investigation. Uh, obviously, they have a ranger who's really good with tracking tracks and all that. 
and they find out that Homer was attacked and killed by a huge beast with claws and teeth. Well, they recognize those traces to be werewolf traces. And they find traces of this werewolf that lead in the direction of the tavern. They start by questioning Judith, because she may have heard something. And she heard two people in the middle of the night going out. Then they went to, if I remember the order correctly, they went to the mayor and they asked him, are there any people here who might not be trustworthy? And he tells them, well, there's the, the vagabond guy. There's also a kid, well, not really a kid, but a teen, who lives at the edge of the village, who only comes out at night. First they went to question Dan. And yeah, he hadn't woken up yet. He had no idea what had happened. But they did find traces that he had gone out. So they didn't really trust him. Basically, they locked him in his room. <laughs> and then they went uh, back downstairs. They didn't really trust uh, Judith. So they went in to, in, well, investigate her. They asked, hey, can we see your room? But they managed to uh, persuade her and they got to see the room, which was filled with uh, books, uh, ancient books with like pentagrams, runes, all sorts of magic stuff. And they figure out she's a witch. And then Jay asked her if she can do something about Homer being dead. Is there some reviving thing that she might be able to do? She said, well, I don't know. I'll look into it, I'll see what I can do. So then they went to the house of that teen. The teen who only comes out at night. All the blinds are closed. And when they knock, at first he doesn't open. And again, and again. So they knock down the door and they just go in. And inside that house are, uh, well, a lot of precious things. Uh, silver candles, a lot of money, <laughs> jewelry. So yeah, they, they wake up this teen and they question him. Like, how did he get all this stuff? Does he know anything about what happened? And he tells them that, well, first of all, all that stuff, he might be a bit of a kleptomaniac. Put it that way. And, well, he only comes out at night, so he did see something. He saw Homer uh, hanging out, uh, playing his lyre, singing songs on the village square. Meanwhile, while this investigation is going on, they tried to see if they knew anything about werewolves and to see, well, is there anything we can do to protect ourselves from them. And Jay remembered, hey, garlic is really good against werewolves. She didn't roll very well. So she started going around and giving everyone garlic to put up to protect themselves from the werewolves. But there was one house that didn't want that, who didn't want the garlic. So she told the group that, and they decided to go to that house to investigate, find out what's going on here. What I haven't mentioned yet is that this game was supposed to be a one-shot. Apparently we're not very good at running one-shots that are actually a one-shot. This one too turned into a long shot, uh, so this is kind of where we stopped playing. When we start part two, we find our adventurers back in the tavern. They are eating lunch. So it's about 3 p.m. now, uh, and they are having lunch, going over everything they discovered. In the corner of the tavern are also a couple of uh, older people, elderly people, uh, playing dice. Our adventurers notice that these older people are catching glances at the necromancer, who's still with them 
they go up to them, literally throw the necromancer on their table, and they ask, do you know this guy? And one of them goes, well, maybe. Is this who I think it is? Well, who do you think it is? Well, I don't know, he, he looks, he kind of looks like the, what's his name again? The old uh, court wizard. And they ask further and they ask, they ask her to tell the story. Turns out uh, that a long time ago, uh, before uh, Queen Regina was queen, when she was just a princess, her father was a king, King Wanox. And he had a court wizard. And King Wanox one day uh, tasked the court wizard to make a philosopher's stone. So obviously the court wizard put a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of money into making the philosopher's stone. And in the end he failed. He made a stone, apparently a very pretty stone, but it wasn't a philosopher's stone, it was just a stone. And you may have figured out by now, they sure did, that the court wizard was the necromancer, whose name is Josh. That's what we ended up calling him anyway. And that this stone was probably the MacGuffin. So they asked themselves, why does the queen want this? Well, turns out she's always loved pretty things, so... That's probably it. After that conversation, after they figure all that out, they went to that one house I talked about. The one house that didn't want garlic. Uh, they knocked down the door. Well, they are greeted by a young looking lady called Renesmee. And she brings them to her husband, who turns out to be called Count Orlok. It is very clear when they look around and they look at these people that these people are very, very rich. So they question them, like, why do you not want garlic to protect yourself from werewolves? Can we check your house? And then they learn that these two are in fact vampires. No werewolves, vampires. Uh, but they do not allow them to search their house because hello private so they actually say well if you want to check our house i'm gonna need you to have permission from the mayor so artorius goes out finds the mayor pretty much just grabs him by the collar and brings him to the house that's what he planned to do anyway well he asked him to give permission to search the house which he didn't. And then he asks, how about a tea party at their place? And he says, okay, let's go. And they just go there. Meanwhile, Jay and Ella were still there. Uh, they get a cup of tea. The mayor arrives, they talk. They still don't get uh, permission to search a place, but they go, well, you have to be able to protect yourself. And they say, hey, we can. They say, look around. And they see a lot of uh, silver stuff, silverware. And also some silver swords on the wall. Uh, and they, then they show their teeth. And they say, hey, we can protect ourselves. But then they ask, aren't werewolves and vampires like ancient foes? Do you, don't you like hate each other? Do you know anything? <laughs> And as it turns out, um, there is one person in the village uh, who they do say had a weird smell to him. And he's a vagabond Dan. So then they leave the place, they go back to the tavern, and first they go to Judith to ask where she is, um, what the situation is. And she is, uh, meanwhile, in her, in her room studying. Behind her is a magic circle with the remains of Homer in it. Because she's trying to, well, preserve the remains and trying to find a way to bring him back. 
And then they uh, go around the tavern. Are there any traces there? And it turns out that on one specific window, there are traces of claws of a huge creature climbing. And it doesn't take much to figure out that that window is in fact Dan's window. Uh, so they go back to Dan's room, open it, and Dan of course asks, hey, why did you lock me in? And they said, well, we have to protect you from the werewolf. He says, okay, good enough. Uh, then they question him. Well, first they bring him down, show him the remains of uh, Homer. He is, of course, horrified, but he doesn't know anything about it. So they sit him, sit him down, everyone gets some beer, and they drink and talk. And they do a test. They get a silver fork uh, from Judith, and they kind of just stick it into his skin. And he screams it out. He screams. It doesn't look the way it should look. It reacts very heavily to the silver. And so, yeah, at this point they're very sure. And they tell him, Dan, you're a werewolf. And he's like, what? And he doesn't want to believe it. And then they ask, did you meet some wolf-like thing? Did it attack you? And he says, well, yeah, I do remember a couple of nights ago, uh, I was asleep and I was awoken by a weird creature. I didn't really see it, but it was big and it was scary. And it bit me. And he shows him the wound. It's very clearly a werewolf bite. So yeah, they have the werewolf. So then they try to figure out, now what? Because Dan is also on board that he doesn't want to be a werewolf. He doesn't want to kill people. He doesn't want to endanger anyone. So uh, they go to Judith's library and they look, they look up everything, everything they can find about werewolves. They find that there is a cure, because lycanthropy, in my world anyway, is not so much a curse as it is a disease, a medical condition. So they find that there is a cure. They find a cure, they find out how to make it, they have a cauldron and everything they need to make it. Judith happens to have a lot of the ingredients. They also needed a diamond, um, because Jay happened to have a diamond. They also needed four uh, plants, spices, I'm not sure, that they didn't have, they didn't happen to have. So they had to go out and look for it. Uh, so it was uh, laurel, mistletoe, aconite, and serpentine. Chosen because of their symbolic significance and connection to purification, uh, the moon, and one of them was literally considered for or against werewolves. And they knew that all of these were to be found in a forest. So they go out, find a forest nearby, and search. Uh, the aconite and the serpentine they find on the ground, so they just take some. Mistletoe they spot somewhere in a tree. So Artorius who tried to shoot it down, <laughs> that didn't work. So then Jay just climbed up and plucked it. So then they go a little further and they find laurel trees. Artorius tries again to shoot it down. Arrow sticks in a, in a branch. Then they try to throw Ella up there. They fail. They try again. They fail again. They manage to throw her, uh, but like only one of them succeeded. So she flies like lopsided. And she doesn't make it to the branch. Then they try a third time, because turn time is a char, and that works. They throw her up there, she manages to grab the tree, and now she's up there. She climbs up, harvests the laurel, then jumps down. And then they are on their way back. It's starting to get dark. And suddenly, Artorius feels 
Dan, who, by the way, they bound, just to be sure, and he's carrying him. Uh, he feels him stirring. He's starting to get hairier. So he throws Dan off and they make space. And Dan breaks the ropes and transforms into a werewolf creature. Roll for initiative. The werewolf attacks Artorius first. Yeah, they fight him. Ella turns herself into a wolf because she can do that. She's a druid. And yeah, they fight the werewolf. Non-lethal though. They try to do non-lethal damage. They just try to make him unconscious. They, want to, they just want to knock him out. They don't want to kill him. It ends with uh, Jay going up to the wolf and knock him in the face. And werewolf collapses. Uh, they bind him again. They decide to take a long rest because um, they could take him back to the village, but imagine if he escapes or something. So they stay there, take a long rest, take turns um, staying guard. Morning comes and they uh, bring him back to, he's at this point turned back into a human. They free him and they bring him back to the village. They go back to the tavern, to um, Judith's laboratory, laboratory, and they brew the medicine. Now, Artorius uh, also did get bitten uh, by the wolf during the fight, so he takes some of the medicine. Uh, Dan takes, of course, a full dose, and then they do the test again. <laughs> and it turns out that he is cured. Yay! Uh, then they go back to Judith, and they find her asleep over her books. So they wake her up, and... She tells them that she's starting to think that it might be, it might just be doable to revive Homer. Uh, they tell her uh, that they managed to cure the werewolf. Then they go back to the mayor to collect their reward. He rewards them. Uh, and then they go back to the tavern again to, well, they decide to just free the necromancer. They just free Josh, because why not? They try to convince him to make something of your life, dude. The MacGuffin is gone now. Just make something meaningful of your life, please. And they let him go. And he ends up playing dice with the elderly. They leave the village, taking the MacGuffin to Queen Regina. Let's do the YouTube thing. You know the drill, right? Comment, like, subscribe, ring the bell, share. And down below, you can find links to my socials. Thanks for watching.